So we begin with a painting that you saw last uh, class, which was one of the series of 12 paintings of the biggest train station in Paris, the Gare saint Lazare, which Monet did in 1877, and which he exhibited that year in the third Impressionist exhibition. It was um, a, a painting that allowed, a subject actually, that allowed him to bring together several of the um, general interests of the Impressionists and his in particular, um, the general interest, which was to show the life as it is being lived right now and the constant state of flux in urban life with his own interest in particular in atmosphere, as, as he'd once said in such a, uh, vivid way that he's not really interested in the trains, the station, but in the air and the atmosphere between himself and that. So it's about the whole, the aura, the, the atmosphere, the humidity, the shifting colors, the shifting clouds. And what does he have now? Not exactly shifting clouds, but he can work with the same themes because now he has playing with the vapors from the steam from the locomotives, as well as the general smog and overhanging clouds in the city. So he can bring his landscape interests and completely fold them into his interest in life in the city. One of the other paintings in that same show in 1877, is equally famous today. And before I move into the primary focus of the day, I thought we should work with this for a little while. And that's Renoir's The Dance at the Moulin de la Galette. So this is um, also was exhibited in 1877. And in fact, it was made a kind of a centerpiece of that exhibition that it had a wall to itself and the critic who wrote a kind of a catalog for the exhibition, who happened to be a good friend of his, and is the man right over here, um, gave the most um, space and ink and thought to describing this particular painting. It shows what is a characteristic of Renoir as an impressionist. Renoir will, move beyond Impressionism, as will Monet, as almost all the artists um, in those shows do. They go either, they either drop out of the exhibitions and begin to show in the salon again, because after all, these exhibitions were um, designed really to, to circumvent the authority of the salon and the authority of those judges who were, by the way, over the years losing their power as things like this exhibition or independent art critics are beginning to um, take a more prominent role in the interface between the public and the painter. Uh, <clears throat> but um, also because they, they moved on to other things. So anyway, this is right, impression matters is at its peak. This is one of the paintings also that American student who I quoted last week, I mean, at that time, Jay, he was a student, J. Aldwin Weir, who became a luminary in the American art education and became a great advocate of Impressionism and encouraged his students to learn all about the ways of painting outdoors and painting quickly. He, when he came in to see this exhibition and would have seen this particular painting, this is one where in his um, strong uh, reaction to it, a negative reaction, called these is just daubs, just painting daubs. You remember he was so irritated that he spent his money going, on to, going in to see this. Well, we'll look at one version of this today that sold for 
78 million in 1990. So that's how things change. So what, what about this painting? Well, I want to tell you about the history of this painting. And it's a kind of reminder of the mm, press, even self promotion of these artists doesn't necessarily um, exactly uh, cohere to um, their actual practices, because this is not a spontaneous scene by, by any means. It is a scene of, of the new Paris. Um, this is a kind of dance hall held in here, this is the Moulin de la Galette. It was one of the surviving grain mills in Paris, um, famous for a kind of a galette, a little, the cake made with the grain ground there. And it well, had been turned into a dance hall. And uh, this dance hall was um, essentially uh, you used as a, um, a weekend escape by working class people that there would be from about noon until midnight, there would be dancing here. That's why you have the lights there. So there's both uh, <clears throat> artificial light and regular light on the scene because here you see it is still daylight. Uh, well, the people who came here for their ale and these little galettes, these little cakes tended to be um, among the men could be any class, um, wealthier men of whom there, I don't know if there are any seen here. You need to look for top, top hats. There's one to show you maybe this is one here. Men of the upper class. <clears throat> and then these boaters, those, those would be mm, the so-called bohemians or anyway, not, not upper class. And the women who would be here would be mm, maids, milliners, performers, no um, well-bred middle class or upper middle class woman would be here. <clears throat> now, Renoir, when he painted this, um, and he painted the whole scene out of doors. We know that from his friend over here who wrote a, you know, kind of reminiscence about it, say about how uh, Renoir and he would take this canvas, which is big. It's like, it's about four feet, I think. I have to remember. I think it's four feet plus. Um, they would take it from Renoir's studio, which was nearby, and then bring it to the uh, Moulin de la Galette and set it up for the actual painting to progress. And of course, that's nothing that could be done in one sitting. So they would, that would be uh, brought in here repeatedly. Right away, you know that that can't be one spontaneous scene just at the moment. And then also many of the figures are friends of Renoir's. There are a lot of them more who have been identified that I, I, don't, I don't know who to identify. Uh, for example, I have read that this young woman, she was a comedian in the Comédie Française, very, very popular stage personality. And this is her sister. Um, let me remember now which of the men. The um, man over here writing a pipe, that's his good friend, I mean, writing with a pen. This is good friend Georges Riviere, who's the one who told about carrying this, schlepping this canvas back and forth. Um, this was a French illustrator. And this man was a painter and an engraver. This man is a Cuban artist. And this woman whose name is known, she taught him how to dance Western dances. And she was a uh, lower class woman. So those are the ones I know. What has he done? Oh, oh, she and she at other times served also as models for uh, Renoir. 
So he's populated this with his friends. It's, it's sort of interesting that the friends, these young men, are, um, it's not Monet, it's not Cecily, it's not Pizarro, it's not young Cezanne, because those people had already begun to settle down. These are the younger artists than that. And they were men who were not particularly interested in Impressionism. They were more of the academic sort of painting. So it's, it's um, outside his painting milieu that, that the friends he's chosen for this. In many ways, Renoir, um, all his life is straddling different, different groups of people. And that's, this is just one example of it. So these are his friends that he's collected in this scene. And I don't know who this child is here. The great puzzle is that there is this work, which is also signed and dated 1876. And um, this is a and not a good reproduction because it was taken from an auction catalog. This is the one that was sold for $78 million. Um, <clears throat> there's a much looser, freer version of exactly the same scene. And it's almost the same dimensions. It's unknown if this is the one that was in the Impressionist exhibition or that one. So this he works in this quite different, even more spontaneous style. But that's a, a spontaneity that um, belies the actuality of the way it was created, because there are also still surviving some um, preliminary works like, uh, you can see how this would be a, say, a quick drawing that he did sometime when he went there. He's working out ideas for it, just sort of like mm, capturing a group that he saw on the fly that, you know, of course, is going to get reworked into this. Or another surviving sketch is of the dancing pair. And he did a larger sketch with these just parallel hatched lines where what he seems to do is somewhat, he still has a little to change. Clearly he's thought out what he wants in general for a composition. And it looks more as if he's working out um, how he's gonna balance the colors, where are the areas gonna be of light and dark and uh, just working the general balance in the scene, which, as you, as you look at it more carefully, I mean, first you just, especially because it's so familiar to us all, you just take it in as, a, as, a, as an entity because it's a very pleasing painting. But then look how very much larger these figures are and they make a kind of a wedge right across this part of the picture. And then you move quite a distance away to get to these figures. So you don't have the sense of there being a distance because the interval on the actual painting on the canvas itself is, is, is small, but they are much, much smaller than these figures. And you take them and then you make another plunge into the distance as figures who become really minute. That's a marvelous way to indicate how a terrific crowd in here. And then the way it's painted. Well, there were people the, who were steeped in the values of traditional academic painting who found this altogether too blurry and, and unpleasant. But some of the younger critics like this fellow here, who enjoyed it very much. Um, here's one, uh, 
uh, who's also a poet, Mallarmé, said, the strong daylight is filtered through the greenery, setting the blonde hair and pink cheeks of the girls aglow and making their ribbons sparkle. The joyful light fills every corner of the canvas and even the shadows reflect it. The whole painting shimmers like a rainbow. So this is someone who's reacting with the most um, sensuous delight to this um, new way of painting on a canvas without an under coat of darker color and without a varnish on top so that you just have this sparkle and the shifting colors, which are, oh, it's really Renoir's forte anyway, but look, look what he does with the glasses over here. This. Or what at first glance and as in the reproductions looks like the customary black jackets of these men, when you look at them closer and not just in the spots that indicate where there's daylight coming through, there must be trees overhead that we're not seeing. That's just the light coming through. Um, but there are actually multitudes of different dark blues. They've gotten a little darker with time. But so you see here, the sunlight, the hair, just a little hot, this light hitting his temple, lower on her face here. That randomness of the light scattered across the scene. And that quick way of painting. Less so in the face, but of course. He is such a portraitist that, that's, that he, he pays the most attention to. Just leave that up, I guess, for the moment. Now move into the main uh, sort of direction of today. These are scenes that women would not be allowed to paint because no respectable woman, respectable, that's my air quotes, but that's um, a, a woman of either a background or some kind of financial support that would allow her to become a painter uh, <clears throat> would, would be in a position to, to attend. This, it just it crosses social barriers um, in an unacceptable way. And it also crossed barriers in education for the women. And that's what I want to start with first. Remember this painting you saw last time by Basile, the summer or the bathing, where it's, all, it's possible that some of the men here could be drawn partly by Basile's looking at Renaissance Italian painting and imitating those poses. It also shows his thorough familiarity and his extreme enjoyment in male bodies, male bodies in all sorts of potion, positions largely young men's bodies, but here quite even a, a child. Um, women were not allowed to study live models in the nude, especially male models. And if they could not do that, in essence, the most meaningful, well, traditionally the most meaningful kind of painting paintings were cut off from them. They couldn't do what we would call history painting. Now, history just means something with a story in it, whether it's a biblical story or classical mythological story or military or medieval story. Um, they did not have a chance to develop that facility with the uh, uh, knowledge of the human body, even if the body is to be clothed and to operate, how, how to study it in motion, where it's foreshortened, how you see it in different ways, how to understand the body. So what were women who went into art, what could, what could they do if that, that was all cut off from them? There was a long tradition of women, you know, sort of the women being able to paint, it's, it's sort of one of the graces they developed. They could 
They could embroider, they could paint. They would know how to play a musical instrument. It was, it was part of being an accomplished person, but accomplished as a, uh, the woman who would make a good wife and good mother, not as accomplished as a professional. Now, already in the prior series, um, people who've attended that will know that there were two women who just uh, broke with this, um, just those constraints didn't hold them back at all. Uh, one of them is the woman who did this, her name is um, Mary Elizabeth Gardner, and she is an American. And this painting was done in 1878. Now that means after the Moulin de la Galette was painted. Uh, <clears throat> and it's the finding of the baby Moses. This was in a in one of the salons. It was, oh, it was accepted. This, this is one of the things amazing about her, that she dared to do something that was a historical biblical scene and on a large scale and with the knowledge that it was going to be accepted. Now, how did she learn that? Well, when she first came from America to Paris, she cropped her hair and passed herself as a boy and studied not at a regular um, art institution, but in the school where youngsters who were going to become um, Auto create uh, carpets, learned how to draw because they'd be still figural tapestries. So that's where she, she, she got her art education. And then she, with great effort, great enterprise, and by marrying one of the deans of the academic establishment, um, made a great name for herself in Paris. But so she did it. And the other one you saw her did was Rosa Bonheur, who did this. Horse fair that you know from the mat, which is about 16 feet long. How did she get to do it? One is her choice of subject, animals, um, which was a separate category altogether and one that almost everybody liked. And she had the good fortune of being married into a family where her father was a radical socialist egalitarian who treated all of his children the same and was able to give them some art education. And then she went on and she studied by studying in vet school, so that, and then on the scene. Ultimately, she was more successful than any of these other artists because the, the paintings were so immensely profitable. So if you just stayed a little bit more inside than that, what happens to you? Well, that's today. First to say just a, a small bit more about this, um, what it would be like for women, because there was, a, there was a restlessness. I mean, why shouldn't there be as many young women who wanted to, to become artists as now there were in the second half of the 19th century, men who wanted to. And this is a, a painting by one of those young women. Unfortunately, she died when she was 25. Maria Bashkirtsev, she was uh, Ukrainian and she came to um, Paris to study. Mm. She was interested in all the arts, but she, she did this painting. Uh, <clears throat> when uh, around 1870 or so, there were several of the those studios that were only very loosely affiliated with Eto Col de Beaux Art, um, <clears throat> where their painters set up um, and took in clients. And the, the one, the Academy Julien, began to accept women. Now they had set, they were um, segregated from the men for studying, but they began to be able to work from the human figure. Now, you know, and this, this painting was actually from 1881, so it had been going on for a little while. But what they don't get to see an adult nude man, they get a boyish figure who's clothed, but they are beginning to see the body and see the muscles and see the particularities of pose. So that's a great step forward. The Ecole de Beaux-Arts that 
most conservative institutions, they did not allow women in until 1895. And even then it was like only, I think there were less than a dozen women. So great institutional uh, objection. So now we come to Eva Gonzalez. You notice how very short her life was. Uh, she died in childbirth. She lived all her life in Paris. Here's a photograph of her. her. She came from a family that was much more receptive to oh, uh, uh, artistic, the desire for artistic expression on the part of their daughter because um, her father was a very successful novelist and her mother was a musician um, from Spanish background, of course. And she must have been just extremely talented. She started doing, um, well, there are not many paintings left now from her early phase, but they, I think she had something in the, accepted in the salon when she was only 16. Um, she did some portraits and some sort of um, medieval imagery, I think. And then she began to work in a more realistic style. And um, a painter who was a friend of Monet, uh, the artist um, Alfred Stevens, who was a dealer artist, uh, introduced her to Manet, who took her on as a student. And she became Manet's only student. And if we were, if I were to be really scrupulous and say only the artists who exhibited in the, with the Impressionists, the group that ultimately becomes called the Impressionists, she couldn't be included because she never showed anything there. But her style and her subject matter absolutely accords with it. She showed in the salon, because remember her, her teacher now, Manet also never showed with that group, but only chose to show in the salon. So how much his view dominated hers is who, who's to say. But for many people until actually quite recently, this is what they knew about her, which was Manet's portrait of her. Oh, this was done around 1870. Um, it's big, I think. Well, at least it's about five feet high. And what you see, is kind of, I find this very, I don't know if I, I'll just say interesting. I don't think I find it amusing. Because what you see here is that she's painting a vase of flowers that must be peonies, because you can see one falling down here. And you can just see a little bit of the curve of the vase. Now there's a discarded sketch or curled up canvas down here. And she has a portfolio. So those are the marks of her career. She has a few brushes and her easel and she's using that mall stick to support her wrist as she's looking over here. But this is very, Manet has done a very old fashioned presentation of her. Think of something like this. This is in the Met, a late 18th century um, self portrait of this woman with just a few rudiments of her practice around her. And these are two of her models, or no, two of her pupils looking at. And she looks out at us. Well, you hardly expect a painter to work in satins in with such a fine feathered hat as that. Nor would you expect her to be wearing this fine white gauzy dress. So in both a woman painter is being presented with the downplaying of the actual craft, the mess, the labor involved. Um, and she's present, being presented as the very Lady Luck way. I, I don't know. I don't know if I want to say that that's Manet's view of her. I don't believe so. Because he took her on as a pupil. 
But I think that's more about Manet's um, often phrasing art in terms of the art of the past that he may be trying to show her uh, in the guise of, of, of painters of an earlier age. It looks like it's done very swiftly, but actually, I guess he did the face over and over and over again. And he changed part of her drapery. He changed the chair. All this is known through, um, you know, radiographic examination of the painting. So what did Eva do? Eva, I think you'd say. Well, here's one of her paintings. This is from around 1870. Now, she was introduced to him when she was 20. So that would have been just, she would have just begun to study with Manet when she did this. And it's, this one is just called The, the Window. It's small, it's about not quite two feet high. It doesn't have any of that sense of it's being um, the preciousness of a, a miniature. I mean, you could have said that this is four feet flat, tall and, and I think it would be a convincing under, to understand it that way too. But, but what does he show? Uh, she show a very realistic painting. This is the one advantage of the development of realism and impressionism for women to get into something because these were subject areas where they are free. Um, and in fact, women, later read you a quote from a woman who's complaining about this, were expected to be able to do flower paintings, fruit paintings, uh, portraits, and genre scenes and sometimes landscapes. So this would fit into that sort of genre portrait sitting. And this is it's thought to perhaps meant to be a Parisian setting. It looks to me, I don't know how you would know that. But you have these two girls, um, this very keen eyed girl uh, is studying. Well, there are many, many second half of the 19th century paintings of girls reading. That, that is part of that nascent interest in giving women an education. Um, I don't think I gave you that factoid yet that it was in 1880 that the French government began to provide public education for women. So they would have had to have private tutors before that. But so she, here she is studying and she has her open books down here and her slightly younger sister with her dolls. But it's a very keen eyed, very pleasing, nice color arrangement and fairly loosely painted scene. Or this one around the same time, it's just called the, the servant or the maid. It's sometime between 1865 and 70, it's as close as can be um, dated. But the speculation is that this would have been in uh, Eva Gonzalez's family's home. And you just have a, it's, it's, this would be a genre scene, you know, she's sort of playing with the cat. There's a, just a little bit of a still life there. And there's that very great interest in women's costumes, which was uh, an interest shared by both men and women as the novelty in women's costume was a, with now manufactured uh, fabrics and uh, many women working as seamstresses. This, this was a great outlet for family display. And that also, you can't call that just a, a realist portrait. Or this one, this is quite small. It's um, not much more than a, well, it's not even a foot and a half high. It's just called Woman with a Fan. And it's a pastel. So this is using those uh, um, in stick form paint that's, it's working, um, very similar to chalk, but slightly um, 
oilier than that, that you can either use it like a chalk or you could rub it on the side. And it, it seems like she started to use pastels even before Monet did. But what's, what's about this? It's a kind of, uh, what's she doing? This is, if, she, if she's on a, some balcony, and here's the balustrade and this is a, this must be worked in stone with a greenery up in here and looking out to see. Oh, it's what a study of different grays and blacks. And that shows her probably responding to Whistler's art. Now, Whistler was a friend of these French artists. He displayed his work in France as well as in England. And this painting of his by the called the Symphony in White, or Woman in White, number one, uh, was the great scandal in the 1863 um, Salon de Refusé of the refused paintings in Paris. But he was working in a monochromatic style. So she's, you see her ambition there. She doesn't have evidently in mind a career, a very satisfying and lucrative career as just a realist painter, that she wants to be a painter on the forefront, moving into the new, what is new. So then she does this one. That's just a girl with cherries. It's also about 1870. Ah, uh, now this begins to look like Monet. Both in the loose brushwork, the love of black, and this kind of graphic style. Well, that's a lot like Monet. This is by Monet at the same time, called Le Repose. And this is Monet's good friend and uh, will become his um, sister-in-law, uh, Bert Morisot. We'll look at her work next class, I think. And she, <laughs> she would evidently express considerable irritation that Eva Gonzalez was also close to Monet. Um, but see that kind of brushwork is like oh, what he's doing. What she's doing over here. Uh, I hope I don't say that too often, but that shows how deeply ingrained I keep calling these artists he, even when I've got a, a woman glory in here. And she does this one, it's, it's called um, The Theater Box, and it's 1874. So it's the year that first Impressionist show. She doesn't submit there. She submits this to the salon. The jurors rejected it. They said, too masculine. She worked it, reworked it some, and four years later, they accepted it. Um, definitely an homage to Mane evident here in the blues and in the bouquet when you again think of the Olympia. But it's a very interesting treatment. Um, this is her sister who serves as a model. And this man, uh, his name is Henry, was the engraver who worked with Mane. And four years after this, um, he will become Eva's husband. So she's not using professional models, but she's, she's oh, there are many long suffering family members who serve again and again as models for these painters. But just a very, that you're sort of invited to find what the story is between the two of them. She's very much forward looking out toward us and what the relationship is between the two of them is not clear. Now in that same year, 1874, that she first did this, Renoir submitted in the first Impressionist exhibition, his painting of 
in the Loge, also at the theater. The scenes in the theater were very popular, as was the theater for, for the middle class. And here there's Renoir's um, very obvious, often professed love for female beauty. But this probably would have been understood by most people as this would be um, a kept woman, let's put it that way. And even her patron here, although he may have paid for her attendance, he's more interested in looking at people across the theater. But with her strings of pearls, her the cost of her costume, she's She's definitely someone who's here rather than at the Moulin de la Galette. And Eva does not show women like that. We have to forget this down here. I think this is a copy of, of a very recently discovered work. Oh, it's been attributed to her, whether it is or not. And it's just called The Alcove. These are now about the mid 1870s of a young girl. And there's that interest we see with Cassatt, with Manet, with Ava, um, with Bert Morris. So, uh, working in the ranges of whites and grays and these new gauzy light fabrics. So this, it's a very intimate scene. Dagon will do some things rather like this. It's really marvelous, this part here. Or equally intimate. This is one of a pair he did. This is just called Morning Awaken. Again, her sister has posed for her. And there's a companion panel where it shows her asleep. They're never too big, but this is, um, well, this is almost three and a half feet across in that sketchy way. With, she's not going to avoid black, that color so uh, frequently used by Manet. And she does a scene out of doors, as undoubtedly her sister yet again. She frequently went to the coast of Dieppe, uh, I mean, a channel here at, at Dieppe, and stayed there during the Franco-Prussian War. So this is like an impressionist landscape with this uh, wheat field here, a kind of a general haze over the whole setting. But think of that in comparison with Monet's, Monet's um, Field of Poppies, which is maybe two years earlier. How Monet and his characteristic wanted to show the whole ambiance in which people live, whereas hers is still uh, the figure's significant. It's true, we don't see her face but we see everything, we're as if seeing what she sees. She did do a few outdoors, quick scenes like this. You see, she does not use the, that Impressionist brush rope. Or this one. This is called The Nanny and Child, and this is in the Washington National Gallery. This is about 1877 or 78. Uh, it's um, kind of an enigmatic work. There's a well-dressed nanny just sitting there looking like she's lost in thought, cast her umbrella to the inside. And the youngster over here, this girl equally lost in thought, looking through a fence. No connection between the two of them. Well, as you can imagine, they probably did get tired of each other's company. Um, I, I've read that this, to the people seeing this, they would probably understand that this would be an English nanny, which would be a sign of uh, 
uh, a wealth if you if you could hire a, a nanny who was English. But what does this refer to? Oh, well. From a few years earlier, Manet's The Railway. Again, probably nanny and girl, utterly disconnected from one another, doing whatever is not understand. But this now is placed in a landscape. So she's not uh, imitating him, but she's taking that theme and um, in a very independent way, reworking it. She used the same threads and, and, and created something different out of it. This is also very much like a later Monet and her very loose work. Well, as I say, her, uh, I should, as, as the end, look, she does one of peonies. How's that for homage to her, her master? And that's his peonies. So it is like a terrible fact of fate that Mane died and she died about a week later. So she, she produced a great deal of work in just one decade and it's um, a great shame we don't have anything else. So now we come to a woman who did show with the Impressionists, Marie Racquemont. She's born the same year as Monet year older than Renoir. And initially, um, you saw this portrait of her from around 1870. Now this is a, a story with ups and downs of an entirely different sort. She, oh, here's a photograph of her. She came from a, yeah, pretty hard scrabble background. I mean, uh, her stepfather moved the family around from one place to another, and um, she hardly knew her father had been a, a sea captain. <clears throat> but she had, from the time she was young, she wanted to be a painter. The story, this is a story that's kind of hard to credit. The, the first painting she ever made was a painting she did for her mother. And to get pigments, she crushed flower petals. So that sounds almost too good to be true. But anyway, she had this great desire to be a painter. And through sheer happenstance, the, a relative of their family doc, doctor was married to Angra, the great Parisian painter, a dominator over the salon, over the, uh, the école, over generations of the imagination and art. And he agreed to take her late in life as a kind of a pupil, especially working through two of his, his, his own students. So she studied with him for several years. But she left and she, she said, why? She said, um, she, she wrote to someone, she, says, um, she said, uh, I want to work at painting and not to paint some flowers, but to express those feelings that art inspires in me. And she said, I doubted the courage and perseverance of a woman in the field of painting and would assign them only to the painting of flowers, of fruits, of still life's portraits and genre scenes. And she wanted more. She did show in the salon. Yeah. And uh, the wife of the emperor, Napoleon III, gave her a commission, after which she was uh, allowed to be a, a, a copyist at the Louvre, uh, which is the way that some women spent their whole career in art. But um, then, let's see. She met this man. 
working at the Louvre, Felix Brackemond, I wouldn't attempt to pronounce her, her maiden name. And he was a, a great etcher engraver. In fact, he sort of revived printmaking as a major art in the later 19th century. A good friend of Monet, a Monet, a Baudelaire, joined those, those groups at the cafe um, conversations where Impressionism was born. He was right in the center of it. And he was also, he exhibited in the first Impressionist exhibition. So it would seem to be a very good marriage. And she learned from him the art of engravings. And this is one of them where she, it's her self-portrait. Uh, this is at once an etching. So anyway, to work with a various print medium. Now I want to show you just a little bit of his work. So in theory, he belongs in this set because do you remember possibly that the original name of the, this group for the exhibition was painters, sculptors, engravers, etc. So there were various engravers in it. And uh, this is a Rachman's engraving of Monet and other work he did. Because in addition to doing fine arts, engravings. He designed um, engravings that could be transferred to pottery. And this is one of the designs for a plate he did. It's just called Notre Dame. This is contemporary imagery. Or contemporary landscapes. Completely of a piece with the interests of the Impressionists. He's showing the, even the conditions of the light. And then his particular all around contribution came through, uh, he went to a, his the printer's office and he found things wrapped up in paper, which were uh, paper from Japan that had uh, Japanese manga. That's a um, Japanese designs on them by the artist Hokusai. And he saw them and he began to just freely copy them. And he created sets of China with those designs. So these are French, these are not Japanese. And these were in the 1867 World's Fair. And they were a terrific success. And after their marriage in 1869, uh, Marie also designed for him. But here he did this engraving of her as a painter. Now she's painting her sister. This is where the difficulty set in. He, she wanted to paint. And especially toward 1880, she is definitely converted to impressionist way of painting from her previous rather realistic style. And he was adamantly opposed. He wanted her to work as a printmaker and not in color. So there are very few paintings by her in an Impressionist style that survive. And they're quite different. These are her prints in a drawing. Also very Impressionist. So cut random view, really nice. And this is pottery she decorated. It was so popular that it was sold before it even got out of the workroom. Here's, a, they had one son, and this is an early portrait she did of him and her very finished, bland, realist style. So she had to work against great opposition from her husband. And uh, according to their son, say when there would be company over, um, he would show his work and hide hers, never bring hers out to see. And he would not accept any criticism from her, although he criticized hers all the time. 
So ultimately what she does is just stop painting. But in the five minutes, show you a few of the few examples there are where she uses her sister, her half sister, and other family friends as models. Um, this one is it's just called um, Woman in White, and it's from 1880. It's her sister-in-law, uh, her sister, but I'll give you a slightly closer work. It's fairly loosely done. She has a very distinctive, independent style. With the interest in color. Look at the shifts in color there, there. Afternoon tea. It's her sister in law again. Why did I say that again? Her sister, half sister. And this is um, done, they live in Sev. Her sister lives with them. So she's using an immediately available subject. And again, a close up. But she does adopt more of that impressionist brushstroke, although it's more like hatching, just regular lines, short, regular lines with a more specific directive quality than say the ones that Monet would use or the, the longer ones that uh, Renoir did. It was sort of like an individual signature. But you see how it's the light reflected. A little bit on her hand here. On the cup. On the terrace, about the same time. See, she loves color. Um, by this time, Gauguin is also um, showing with the Impressionists. And he is one who especially nudges her toward more and more vivid color. Um, this one's called, just called Under the Lamp. This is later, 1887. It's one of the very last paintings she did, and she lives for a long time after this. Um, she was um, partly an invalid, but just according to her son, the distress created at home was too great for her to be able to continue this painting. And this is the Impressionist artist Alfred Seasley and his wife. And for that, I have another close up. She too is working with the entirely domestic scenes now because she's absolutely constrained to her by her life circumstances. They were good friends of all the Impressionists especially through her husband. And the final one of her son, who later became more a decorator than a painter. So in the last session next week, we'll look... Um, more at the art of Bert Morisot. I don't know if possibly a little of Degas. And now I'm so happy to entertain any questions or requests to go back and look at something.
There are none, I gather. Hmm. All right, then. These, these paintings are also peaceful, Maggie. Um, yeah, it's extremely difficult to, to understand these were considered so upsetting, isn't it? Because to us, they're, they're just a wonderful... <laughs> world of the past, sort of, yeah. But these were just thought to be, um, these artists were often by the, um, some of the general public still thought to be, they must be political radicals um, because they're just too upsetting. Hmm. Yeah. Hard to imagine. Yeah, I think so, I think so too. Thank you so much. I tried to imagine that color as being offensive, just deeply offensive. Yeah, blue. Well, it's blue. And look at this. It's playing with complementaries, blue and orange. Yes. Yeah. I mean, really. Yeah. So well done. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. You, don't, you can almost feel the sense of the fabric. Yeah. Well, what, look, if we go all the way back to, oh, Mary Elizabeth Gardner, poor woman, the way I go after her. If this, and that's not a bad color reproduction, this was what was considered good painting. Oh. Nowadays, when we look at it, it's like, oh my goodness, right? <laughs> Not good. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not very appealing. No. Not much. Um, not much sense of um, reality. No, it wasn't supposed to be. It's to be an ideal world to which you aspire. It's not. Yeah. I just, oh well, I find this, I'd like to be able to rise above it and, and be objective, but I find this also just really rough, <laughs> just rough to look at. Yeah, it is. You don't sense, um, I miss very much the sense of having any contact with the artists that these kinds of paintings present. Uh, this would be like what artificial intelligence should produce. <laughs> you know, no personality, no hand at work. Yes, yes, that's right. It doesn't really project to you a true subject and activities. I mean, it's just like there. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, we shouldn't, I suppose, be just... Just like you can sell anything nowadays as being impressionist if it's bright color and has loose brushwork and everybody likes it, see? You, you can fool people in the same way now. Um, with, with just the opposite, but uh, uh, look, when, which um, there is a Steve Jobs who had an art collection, or well, one one of the big tech guys had his collection show. They were all bright colored impressionist works. Said, yep, of course, that's what sells now. <laughs> What sells is not necessarily tasteful. <laughs> well, did you see, this was this was taste. Oops, this was good taste. I won't hang into my house. No, <laughs> no. But the one thing it could reassure people: it had a message that was meaningful. And if you did not trust your own instincts. You could tell it was carefully painted by someone who knew how to do it. They had spent a lot of work on it. It was carefully done. It, no way could you call that sloppy. 
No, it's very detailed. So you, you had that kind of ob objective external to art criteria by which this is good. Yeah. Well, I don't, yeah. I don't. let's not linger on that. We'll go back with finish with Alfred Cecily and his wife. Yeah. yeah, that has uh, a pleasant environment. Yes, it has humanity, doesn't it? Yeah, you feel the sense of the, the soup or the stew, and that they're sitting down to have a pleasant conversation. Right, and you have a sense of the kindliness. Maybe he wasn't, but it looks there. Yeah. And she does too. She has a very... Uh, uh, alert, look off to the side here at something. Yeah, okay. she has a very appealing mm -hmm. face. Mm -hmm. Kind-looking face. Mm -hmm. That's probably idealized, but yes. Oh, well. All right. Thank you for some comments, because I, I find it difficult when it seems to me I'm just talking to a void. Oh, I think, I think you enchant us, Maggie. Well, yes, but I need to have someone respond, you see. I'm yeah. glad I would enchant you, but I don't like to enchant empty air. <laughs> like no. There's a person on the other side of the screen. <laughs> yeah, I understand, but it's, it's your... Um, your presentations are always so meaningful and and uh, quite, I mean, interesting, delightful. Um, oh, thank you very much. Yeah, it it, it feels good to to right. uh, ha listen to you speak the way you do because you know what you're talking about. Well, it is that I love this stuff. Yes, I it's very love it. <laughs> I love it. And the more I look at this, look, he's got the gleam. She's got the gleam of silver. Yes, yeah. The shoes nope. sells the, nice the glass. And look at look at even the bracelet on her. Uh -huh. She was a very good painter. Well, Maggie. she was called one of the three great painters of the female painters of the movement. Yes. Um, yes. Is there any thought of going back into in person for your art classes, your course? You, um I, 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 I said, uh, um, uh, I emailed Michelle last week because I was so distressed to see how low the enrollment was. And she said it is because people weren't uh, in person, as do I. And she said that it's, the difficulty is getting the technology um, because there are some people who are regular attendees who cannot come out in person for whom this is a, a boon. So the ideal is to have something that can be in person, but that could be taped. Yes. And, and it, uh, Mount Claire just can't afford that technology. I see. So it's something that we're, we're working on. Okay. I, 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 would do, I would love to be back in person. Love it. Oh, okay. I didn't know what your preference was. Oh, yeah. I did come back way back when, when it was at the museum and it was, it was more spontaneous, you know, to be able yeah. to just speak. Absolutely. Um, so if anyone can think of anything to move along or know of any way to move, are familiar with anyone who handles this simultaneous in person and then online, um, Please let Michelle know so that we can investigate it. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Goodbye. Thanks, Maggie. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank, Thank you, so, you much. so much.